Luke 18, Mark chapter 10. Luke 18, Mark, Mark chapter 10. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, we look to you now for help from your word this day. Lord, we seek your wisdom and we come to your throne of mercy realizing that without you we have nothing we are nothing realizing that daily we need to trust you and build our faith upon you knowing that you are the great god the almighty god the holy god who willingly gave his son jesus christ to die on the cross for our sins and that he lay dead in the tomb and on the third day he arose from the dead victorious over death Lord, we thank you for that wonderful sacrifice that he made for us. And that through faith in him and repentance of our sins, we can have eternal life with him one day in heaven. And Lord, we know the time is short. We know Jesus is coming soon. And I pray that we would make the best use of our time that we would be your ambassadors and your ministers to others, showing your love to them and letting them know the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would give us this wis your wisdom daily, today and every day. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 18 and we're going to, well, I'll start at verse 24. Luke chapter 18, verse 24. Luke 18, verse 24. This is at the end of him speaking with the, the uh, rich young ruler. In verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with God are um, the things that were the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Boy, man has that backwards today, don't they? The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Sadly, the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus Christ. He was very sorrowful because he did not want to sell everything he had and give it to the poor and take up his cross and follow Jesus Christ. The rich ruler chose to enjoy the temporal things of this world rather than repent and believe on Jesus Christ. His great possessions were not what was keeping the ruler from following Jesus Christ, but the fact that he loved his riches and trusted in them rather than on Jesus Christ kept him from being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Keep your finger in Luke, but go over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, drop down to verse 24. Mark 10, verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Many a soul has been kept from eternal life with Jesus Christ because they refuse to love him more than anything or anyone else. 
The ruler was trusting in his possessions for his happiness, and he had been trusting in his works in order to have eternal life. If only he had been willing to forsake all and take up his cross and follow Jesus Christ. The ruler could have had untold treasures waiting for him in heaven, and better yet, he would have an eternity with his Savior, Jesus Christ. The ruler trusted in his possessions to bring him happiness. He likely worked very hard to gain what he had, and sadly, they can be very hard to give up. And we see that over and over. We saw that when we went through the book of Ecclesiastes three years ago. I was checking my records. And in fact, go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. And if you remember from Ecclesiastes... Everything that Solomon did, he ultimately saw it as being vanity, that it was worthless and it was nothingness. And what bothered Sam Solomon as much as anything was, was that he worked so hard for everything that he had and he had gained great possessions, and yet he bemoaned the fact that he would not be able to enjoy them. Someone would come after he died and enjoy the many fruits of Solomon's labors. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof. But a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and, this is, and it is an evil disease. And how sad, because it did not seem fair to Solomon that he would gain all these blessings from God, that God would give him these riches, wealth, and honor, and yet he wouldn't be able to enjoy them himself. Now really, when you think about it, Solomon had his house built within the early part of his, before the first half of his reign was even over. He reigned for 40 years. God blessed him with being able to build a beautiful home to live in. You really think he didn't get to enjoy that? You know, but he wasn't content. He wasn't happy with what he had and instead looked at his circumstances and said, oh, somebody else is going to get to enjoy the fruits of my labor even as he recognizes that God gave it to him. What a contradiction, but that's how our minds think. We don't think straight half the time because our thoughts are turned towards ourselves and not towards God. And that is what each of us need to remember. What we have is only because of God, not because of our own efforts. That we do not have more is because of God, and that we do not have less is because of God. The ruler could not imagine someone else enjoying the fruits of his labor, and he wanted to keep the riches, wealth, and honor that he had to himself. Go back over now to Luke chapter 18. We're done in Ecclesiastes. Luke 18, verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Those that do have great possessions can now be harder to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they are comfortable with the life that they have right now. You can tell them of the mansion that they could have waiting for them in heaven. And they might say, but I have a mansion now. I do not need another. You can tell them of the fine robes of righteousness they, ha they could have in heaven. And they might say, 
but I wear the finest clothes now, and made by famous makers. I have no need for others. You could tell them of the honor and heavenly treasures that could be there for them, and they might say, I have riches now, and people already honor me and look up to me. I am the envy of all. I need nothing else. And how sad that the riches and great possessions of this world are coveted and revered by many, but they will not do those people any good on the day of judgment. Remember back in the 70s or 80s, there was, was it Robin Leach and Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And what a famous, popular show that was for many, many years, and showing the, the opulence and the riches of these people and their lives. And everybody wanted to be like those people and have those people's things. But all are going to die. You can't take any of it with you. Too many are looking to the temporal and ignoring the eternal. They want what they want right now. And they fool themselves into believing that they can make up for it later. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus Christ tells the parable of the certain rich man that had a bumper crop from his fields, and he has more crops than he has space to store them. Rather than give to the poor, the certain rich man decides to pull down his barns and build bigger barns so that he can take his ease and enjoy the fruits of his labors. Jesus Christ then states in Luke chapter 12, verse 20, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. It is not having the great possessions that is wrong. It is what you do with the possessions, and if you are thankful to God or not, that is important. Do you allow your possessions to be an idol in your life? Are you daily grateful to God for what you do have? And when you think about what he's saying with these things, it's not just for the rich people. It's for any wealth class of people. Are you willing to give it all up and follow Jesus Christ? Are you daily grateful to God for what you do have? Are you content? Keep your finger in Luke, but go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, drop down to verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You can have everything in this world, but you cannot take it with you. You came into this world empty-handed, and you will leave this world empty-handed. Money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. So often with the many scandals and crimes of this world, if you follow the money trail, you will find the criminal as well. Instead, be content with what God has blessed you with and use it wisely. Those that desire to be rich will be drawn away from God. Why? because their lusts are toward self-sufficiency rather than relying upon God. They desire to be rich. How often have we talked to people and they say, 
oh, I just need to work this job and this job so I can be a little more comfortable. Or I need to do this job and that job, and I need to work a lot of hours to provide for my kids. But are you then there for your kids? That's the sad part. The kids are grown up. You provided for them. You provided the best in the world for them, or as best as you could provide. And they have all kinds of stuff. But do you know them anymore? Do they know you? And that's the sad part. Those that desire to be rich will be drawn away from God. I ask you, could you lose everything you have and lose everyone you have and still declare, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh, hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, as Job said. That is something to pray about and consider. Are you content with what you have? It may not be the life you envisioned for yourself in your younger years but it is the life that you have now. So be content in it and trust in God. Paul does give you what to say to those believers that are rich in this world. First, go back over to, oh, you're in First Timothy. Drop down to verse 17. Verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. You may have financial riches, be sure to be ready to distribute them, help others, minister to others. As God has blessed you, be sure to bless others. Not because you believe that it will commend you to God, but because you desire to help. Remember, compared to a large portion of the world today, you are rich. God wants your obedience and not your sacrifice. You will not be judged for your riches and your great possession, but God does look at your godliness, holiness, your character, and your service to others. Remember, while in the temple, Jesus Christ observed rich men giving their offerings to the temple treasury, <clears throat> and then he saw the widow giving her offerings. He stated in Luke chapter 21, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Do you believe God will look at how many extra hours you worked and how many vacations you took? And how nice a vehicle you drive and honor you for that? Do you think God will honor you for your classic car, your classic motorcycle? Do you think God will look at your loyalty to sports, your loyalty to entertainment stars, your loyalty to the things of the world and commend you for it? No, God looks at the heart. As Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Go back over to Luke chapter 18. We're done in Timothy. Luke 18, verse 25. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You must remember that it is God that does the saving. You cannot save yourself. Nobody can save themselves. Trusting in riches will accomplish you nothing. 
It is truly a miracle of God's grace that anyone can be born again. Remember, that rich young ruler came up to Jesus saying, What must I do to gain eternal life? The answer is, believe. Repent and believe the gospel. No amount of works will ever do that. A rich man that puts his faith and trust in his riches will not enter the kingdom of God. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't read in there, you need to do something, or you need to keep doing something. It's a gift of God. To be born again, a person must believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died for you to pay the wages of your sins, that he was buried and that he resurrected from the dead on the third day and is alive eternally. You must repent of your sins and believe the gospel. It is a miracle that God saves, that he chooses to love you and care for you and reconcile you to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, after hearing Jesus Christ speak about the rich ruler, look at what the disciples said. Verse 26, and they that heard it said, who then can be saved? It is a miracle that God saved you. And please, please, please do not assume that a person cannot be saved because of their appearance, their lifestyle, their wealth, or their lack of wealth. God saved you, didn't he? It is a work of God and not your own work. As Jesus Christ stated in verse 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. God is the one that saves to the uttermost. If God was willing to save you, then please have compassion on others and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not your job to try and save them. It is your job to minister to them and give them what is needful, the gospel. Luke 18, verse 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. The apostles did leave all and followed Jesus Christ. They left behind fishing nets and tax collector records and other jobs and family, and everything in order to follow Jesus Christ. They understood what was truly important, Jesus Christ, and they left it all behind. How about you? Are there idols in your life that you refuse to let go of? God does not deny you possessions, but he does want them to have the proper place in your life. Jesus Christ should be at the center of your life. Everything and everyone else comes after him. Verse 29. And he, Jesus, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now verse 30 does not mean that if you leave everything for Jesus Christ, he will bless you with more stuff. It does mean that your treasures will have the proper place in your life. It does mean that you will find that godliness with contentment is great gain. As Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 4, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. 
Be happy with what you have and share what you have with others. Minister to others. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man will do unto me. You will receive manifold more in your life here in this present time, you will have more peace and more joy in serving the Lord God of heaven. There will be more peace because you will not fear what man can do to you. God is sovereign and in control. Your true peace and comfort, which passes all understanding, is found in him. There will be persecutions. You will lose family members and friends. You will be mocked and scorned. But your ultimate treasure is not here on earth. It awaits you in heaven. And Paul said, I count it all joy. I count it all joy. And it amazes me. You know, we've heard recently these, these prominent Christians that... that They've written books and written songs about God, and they've gone and renounced the faith. They said, I no longer believe. And science is, is better. And, and all this other hogwash. And, and they're saying, I'm happier now than I ever have been. Liars. Liars. How sad for them. We pray for them. They were never of us. Because once you're one of Christ, you can never leave. And so if they were never with, they were never with us. And how sad for them. But they're not happier now. Or they may be for the moment, but in a week or two, month or two, they won't be. And they'll go into the old sins again. And all they had done was just cleaned up their lives and lived a good moral type life. They never knew Christ. How sad it'll be on that day. But Lord, I wrote this wonderful hymn to you. Oceans. <laughs> I, where feet may fail. I wrote this wonderful hymn to you. And he's still going to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Some of the saddest words in the Bible. How sad for that man. We need to pray for his salvation. I don't want to see him go to hell. I don't want to see anyone go to hell. We need to be praying for these people. We need to be praying for this country. We need to pray for repentance in this country that people would turn back to God, would turn to God first, and that churches would turn back to God and people would follow Jesus Christ and not all this other stuff that's out there. You are ministers and ambassadors in this present time. And if you are a believer on Jesus Christ, you have a mission to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I are strangers in a strange land, sent from a far country as representatives of our Lord, King Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has charged you. Jesus Christ has told you, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The time is getting short, and people need to hear of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. People are hurting, and you have the answer for them. It is not about programs and recovery systems and the like. It is about Jesus Christ and his gospel message. 
Are you willing to leave all and give out the gospel? Are you willing to humble yourself and risk embarrassment and humiliation and scorn to tell someone about Jesus Christ? The risk is great, but Jesus Christ is greater. And in the end, the reward is greater. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. And he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. The, de the disciples did not understand what Jesus Christ was saying to them. They heard the words, and he told them these words more than once. But they did not understand the full import of these words. All of these things that were soon to happen to Jesus Christ were written by the prophets, and he was going to accomplish them. Jesus Christ had to die on the cross. His sacrificial death was necessary to pay for your sins. The gospel of Jesus Christ is more than follow Jesus Christ. Remember back toward the beginning of this message, I spoke of how you could tell a rich person about the mansion that waits for them in heaven. What they must first, I'm sorry, the mansion that waits for them in heaven and the robes and the riches and honor that waits for them in heaven. But what they must first understand is their great need for salvation from the wrath of God. People everywhere must repent. Jesus Christ said at the beginning of his ministry, repent ye and believe the gospel. This is much more than just follow Jesus Christ. People need to see that they are condemned and that they are lost without Jesus Christ. Do you care? You can read Luke 18 verses 31 through 34 and realize that you have an advantage over the apostles. You have the completed word of God in your hands. You know what happened to Jesus Christ. And there is hope in him. Look at the people around you. So many have no hope or they are trusting in the wrong things. And it's leading them in the wrong directions. Is it any wonder the suicide rates keep going up? There is always hope. There is always hope even if you have absolutely nothing else there is always hope because of Jesus Christ. There will be a tomorrow because of Jesus Christ. He arose from the dead. Through him you have eternal life in heaven. All of this will be as a vapor and gone, but eternity is forever. This is so much more than follow him, follow Jesus Christ. Why? What makes him different? Because he died for your sins, was buried, and he rose again. That's what makes him different from every other religion out there. Every other religion out there says you need to work. You need to follow this, follow that. What did Jesus Christ first say? Repent and believe the gospel. All of this will be as that soap bubble. It'll float through the air. It'll look pretty for a moment. And then, boop, gone. Our lives are short. But eternity is forever. You have a commission from your king. Jesus Christ tells you to go and tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now go and teach about the love 
of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to forsake all for him? And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you, God, again for this passage today. I thank you, Lord, that there is hope in Jesus Christ. So much of the world wants to offer hope in so many other ways. But God, all of those ways are man-centered and in man's wisdom. Lord, I pray that we would instead follow your wisdom and your ways. That we would trust you and believe on you, and build our faith upon you, knowing that you will guide our every step when we stay close to you. God, I pray we would remember daily that we are your ministers to others. And Lord, I thank you because you've equipped us to do this, and I thank you that you're willing to use someone as low as me to do just this. I pray, Lord, that as we go through this week, we will be vessels that are fit for your use. And I pray, Lord, that we would reach out to all that we meet. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.